and welcome to Roadmap 2019. On this program, we'll talk to the major players in Nigeria's political journey to the elections in 2019. I am Ladi Akiri Dolwale. Thank you for being with us. My guest on today's edition is one of Nigeria's former leaders who says her citizens love to talk and that sometimes they focus too much on the messenger instead of the message being brought. My guest also insists that Nigeria's current security challenges must be tackled in creative and unconventional ways, and that to battle corruption in Nigerian society, a revisit must be made to the country's value system. Now, please join us as we speak to the former military president of Nigeria, General Ibrahim Babangida. Your Excellency, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us on this day. You are most welcome. General says a special place in my heart. I believe I can, I can guess at least part of the reason. You can try. You, you, you opened up the broadcast space for private initiative. Absolutely. And I'm proud that for 12 years now, you have remained number one. Indeed. Indeed. So it's not a misplaced confidence. It's Thank you very congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so many people have heard so much about you, but they don't really know you. For most people, they don't know you. Um, I was reading something interesting about when you were in secondary school, and uh, your nickname was Megari, owner of the house, because you, you used to defend younger students against bullies. Um, what, what, what guided that? in your mind? Because then you weren't in the military, you weren't a soldier. Well, the Megari started, actually, the name given to me was Ibrahim. At that time, I'm talking about 1940s, the Emir of Ushishi was called Ibrahim. And Megari is the Emir. So I was nicknamed the Megari. That's how I came by that name. Now, um, you, 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 those who know you say you carried that off into your career in the military. You, you disliked having junior officers singled out for victimization or, or uh, punishment, or just on due punishment. I think in a way that was true. This happened when I was in primary school and then carried the same into secondary school and then in the military service. Uh, I have always stood by my subordinates, no matter the offenses. They taught us when we were cadets that if a sergeant commits an offense, you don't shout at him in the presence of other soldiers. You call him to your office and give him all the abuses and the bollocking you are going to do. So it's part of our training, and uh, it just happened that I blended into the tradition of the army. Do you think today, with the challenges we face, they are a bit stretched? You are talking like a military man. I think they are stretched. The country is large. Uh, Borno State, for example, Northeast is very large. And by our training, you, cannot, you are not going to put a soldier in every square in, in a centimeter. That's out of it. So you have to get, and the distances, the equipment, the machinery, those are very important. I think they are overstretched. I wasn't surprised they created some formations, brigades, divisions, and so on because of the enormity of the job they are doing. Now, uh, during your time as president, we didn't face this kind of security challenges. What I mean is... Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I mean is in terms of the uh, insurgency. Now, I've had cause to read in places where you had said one or two things about how you thought this could be tackled. Um, could you take us through that? Well, in any situation of insurgency or stability operations, 
the aim of those who organize themselves into insurgency is not to confront a regular army because they don't have the strength, they don't have the equipment, they don't have the training. So their, their concept is to inflict maximum casualty on governments, properties, human beings at this using the smallest possible number of troops. So it's like um, a suicide bomber. He's probably, he or she is probably one. Go into a marketplace and blow up everybody. So this is one woman killing about 20 or 30 odd people. That is the concept. And you have to understand that very well. The purpose of doing that was to tell the public, the Nigerian public, that the government could no longer defend them, the government could no longer protect them. So it's psychological. They try to put a lot of psychological effect on the populace. Now, how do you tackle that? It's a double-edged double sword. First of all, um, you have to understand the concept, why is it, how they operate that way. And once you do that, important places, you have to keep them well, well protected, where there are a lot of people have got to be secured, and so on. And assuring the people, there is also what we call psyops, psychological operation. Ass assuring the people that, look, the government knows what is happening. We are here. We will protect you. Go about your normal business. It's psychological. And uh, dish out a lot of not so good information about the other people so that the populace will have confidence that no matter what happened, the military is there to protect them. Now, uh, the insurgency has, appears to have taken a number of forms, depending on who you believe and what you hear. Mm -hmm. um, what started off, for example, as simple clashes between farmers and herdsmen has snowballed into a much bigger crisis, and we're told that it's simply an extension of the insurgency. Now, whether that is true or, or, or false, again, that seems to be an entirely different kind of security challenge. Uh, how do you think that can be handled? What we tend to forget is that the insurgents have also got technician, tacticians or people who think for them. And once they do that, then you have a problem. You have to find a way of countering that... Uh, the new tactic. Yeah, the information they dish out. I think it's, there is no way other than good equipment, good training, psychological operations. That's all we need to do. Now, um, you had always been an advocate of unity, Nigeria's unity, uh, I believe. Uh, you were the first Nigerian leader to, to use the phrase non-negotiable. That you can discuss every other thing, but that you can't. That cannot be subject to discussion. Of course, there have been people who oppose that and who say, well, everything is subject to discussion and everything should be subject to discussion. You said that a long while ago. Do you still believe that? Well, I still believe in that because during the war of national unity, at least two million people or three million people have lost their lives in the course of this keeping the country one. Are we fair? Are we as a people fair to those who put down their lives so that we remain united? Are we fair to them, to their families, to their brothers, sisters, everything? These people put down their lives and they were killed. So I think to be fair to them, we have no option but to accept what they have done. And the best we could do, because they sacrificed their lives for us to remain united, we shouldn't negotiate anything to do uh, with, with the uh, unity. Yeah. Now, uh, what do you think we should do at this point? Because it seems as if 
People talk about restructuring, uh, true federalism, the various phrases, but all essentially saying, well, we need to adjust the way we have related. This is the beautiful thing about Nigerians and Nigeria. For every subject, you have as many opinions as there are people in this country, and everybody wanted to be had. But uh, it's all well and good. It's for the leadership or the leaders of the country to accept those that this is Nigeria and allow them to say whatever they want to say. At the end of the day, you have to make a dec you have to take a decision, whether right or wrong. But bearing in mind that that decision was taken in the interest of the country, and I think uh, I will listen to a lot of arguments. Surprisingly, I will be proud to say that all this, what is, what you are talking about now, started during the military regime. We had committees that sat up and talked about party system, the number of parties. We had devolution of powers. Even in the military, we were talking about that. Um, later, Abdurrahman Okene, <coughs> excuse me, was the chairman that we put to do that for the country. And everything people are talking now, we have said it before, before 1993. So I think this is typical Nigeria. We understood that we must allow you to talk. Otherwise, so. But uh, beyond talking, because now, I mean, people have talked, as you said, for a long time, they've been talking. But in terms of what actually gets done, not much has changed uh, in terms of repairing what people identify as the cracks, if, if, it were, if, if one is to describe it as such. I mean, take, take, take the issue of states and their inability to pay salaries uh, and things like that, and having to be bailed out by the federal government. Uh, the local governments uh, being the governments closest to the people, but not actually being able to do much. I mean, I use those two examples to set what it is that uh, people are talking about adjustments to say, look, maybe we need to do something about this. Now, as you said, Nigerians should talk. They should be allowed to talk. After all, this is a democracy. They should be allowed to talk. But beyond talking, in terms of actual concrete action, do you see us having a way forward in this regard? Yes, I think <clears throat> there is a way forward. We advocated a sort of relationship between what the masses or the general public is talking about what the government is trying to do and what the media will be dishing out to the people. And I had a lot of discussions with some of your bosses and they were very forthcoming. Okay, this is where we want to go. How do we achieve it? Um, if, for example, somebody who opens his mouth, he abuses everybody, why do you give him prominence? Why do you allow him to, to say anything at all? If, because the whole purpose is to be had. If you shut him up, you have solved one problem. He will only abuse you for not... Uh, Allowing but, him to Yeah, help. but you have a reason for not doing it. Uh, I think if we have that understanding between those who talk, those of you who give us the information, and those of them in the leadership position, who know exactly what they want, and what they want is in the interest of the country, I think there should be no problem. What do you make of the whole controversy around the issue of hate speech? Because that speaks to what you just said now. Allowing people to talk when they say certain things that really get other people upset. Uh, they abuse everybody, they don't offer constructive criticisms, they expect their views to be heard only, and they try to drown out other voices. Um, I want to resist the temptation of defending my constituency, but we, what we do is we report what people say. Uh, and we won't say they didn't say it. After all, that's what we're there for. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, if you don't allow them to talk, or if you try to regulate what they say, that seems to be antithetical to the government, uh, the government mode we're practicing. Why should you 
not regulate somebody who should tell you, let's go to war. Ob obviously, he doesn't know what he was talking about. Either he has no historical background of the country, he didn't realize what this country went through. So it's like drawing us back, give him less uh, prominence and uh, things will be okay. But if he goes up on top, there are a lot of Nigerians love people to be abused. It's, it's sometimes uh, we used to wonder whether the sign of courage is to abuse somebody in, uh, in a public office. If you are able to do that, then you are a courageous man. You don't give him that uh, opportunity. If he reasons constructively, like you rightly said, fine. You can write editorials, you can ask your columnist to write about it. This is fine because it's good for the country. But if it's not, ignore him.